So let's just talk about how we prepare our patients. I'm going to do this very quickly. I think most of this you know. It's just to highlight a couple of things that's important in terms of art prep. So very important, we're starting everybody on the same day um, or within seven days if there's any reason why you need to delay. Um, but of course, if the patient's not ready, you can't force people to start on treatment. If you've got any acute OIs or TB that needs to be sorted out, you're going to have to wait. And then our TB meningitis is our cryptococcal meningitis, you have to wait. And there's a nice little table in your, um, in your guidelines just to highlight patients now who are CRAG positive and LP negative. We actually initiate also on the same day. You don't have to wait that two weeks. And then in drug-sensitive TB, they, um, they've they made that sort of quite absolute now that if the CD4 is under 50, we want to start our ARVs within two weeks. But they do recommend that if the CD4 is over 50, you wait eight weeks. So that's what's recommended in the guidelines. From a public health point of view, this has been quite controversial. Because the reasons why we're starting everybody on ARVs on the same day is not for mobility mortality reasons, but because we're worried about uh, the spread of HIV. So we're trying to reduce the HIV incidence. So now to wait eight weeks to put somebody on their ARVs, as soon as they're going to start feeling better from their TB, they're going to be sexually active again, they're going to have very high viral loads and actually at a very high risk of infecting somebody else. So in practice, uh, a lot of us start around the four-week mark. Um, but it's one of those things debated between the infectious disease guys and the public public health guys. Though, of course, the earlier you start the art, the higher the risk of iris, but iris can be managed. Um, so it's it's one of those discussion points. So your baseline assessment, very important. Obviously, examine your patient well. If you're starting somebody on HIV, please remember to look in the mouth. So HIV in stage two often have skin um, symptoms, undress your patient. I've seen patients where Kaposi's on the legs have been happily missed or when people have missed thrush or Kaposi's in the mouth. So always look in the mouth. Obviously weight, very, very important um, as we're gonna monitor that and it's an important prognostic um, factor. Um, and now very important, HIV is becoming an illness that is, we're seeing, we're diagnosing it very early. So you're seeing it in people who are quite well and actually, we're now seeing non-communicable diseases as much more of an issue. So doing your uh, screening for diabetes, very important, and screening for your um, other NCDs, your blood pressures, checking your mental health of your patient, obviously do your PHQ2s, uh, check for substance abuse, and obviously look out for STIs and pregnancy because they're at the risk. If you're HIV positive, you're at risk of those at, as well. Blood pressure, urine dipstick is therefore part of it. Um, and then very important to do your risk assessment. If you want to look for your NCDs, just remember to do your waist circumferences and to look out for metabolic syndrome. There's a whole presentation on cardiovascular risk assessment um, that tells us how to do that. Also new in the, um, in the guidelines, all patients 10 years and older, if they're HIV positive, you're obviously gonna screen them for TB, but you're also gonna do a gene expert as baseline. So that's also was new in the guidelines. Um, and that and obviously have always included our pregnant women. So at the beginning, do your gene experts. So urine lamb, um, if patients do have TB symptoms, we obviously want to go and make sure that um, and TB lamb is a nice way to help us keep track. The guidelines for TB lamb in terms of when we do urine TB lamb. So in the, so the Department of Health guidelines, all patients that are admitted, you can do a TB lamb on. So if you admit somebody to internal medicine, just do the urine lamb. It doesn't matter what their CD4 is. On an outpatient level, all patients that got a CD4 count of under 200 with TB symptoms that are HIV positive, you can do a urine lamb on. So we're quite flexible around that. The only reason why we don't do lambs on the higher CD4 counts is to save some lambs. Um, they're just not, not, not very helpful. The HIV Clinician Society has got a slightly different thresholds, um, but I would use I would use the public sector thresholds. Obviously, do an X-ray if you are still not winning with your lamb or if it's clinical indicated, um, and if you can get a needle in somewhere. So if your sputum, um, obviously you're going to send a gene expert and TB culture on your sputum, mm -hmm. but if you can find a, anywhere anywhere if you're taking fluid out of a chest, out of an abdomen, out of the, please remember to send for both gene expert as well as a TB culture um, for, for future reference. 
if you need to do blood, so say you've got a patient where the x-ray wasn't very helpful and the lamb was negative and they've got TB symptoms, the main bloods that's quite helpful is checking for anemia, obviously, checking for your CRP um, and looking for an obstructive picture on the LFT, the ALP and gamma GTs. I'm going through these things very quickly. They're also covered in other, other places. So based on investigations, now you've got your patients HIV positive, you're gonna do a CD4 count. They will do the CRAG automatically for you, um, supposedly under 200 in the, um, eventually in the DOH, but I haven't seen that. Creatinine and EGFR, obviously, you're going to do your HP. Please don't do a whole um, full blood count unless the HP is low. Remember to do our vitalis B serum antigens. Remember to do our gene experts. And then our cervical sc cancer screening for our HIV positive patients every three years. Um, and the HIV Clinician Society does include a baseline ALT, a viral load, and they actually do a urine not for chlamydia and nasseria, which is very nice. But at our, in our scenarios, we do not do a viral load um, at baseline. Just to uh, remember our cutoffs for assessing renal function to start to nofibr. So for EGFR, we're quite happy if the GFR is over 50. If anybody is 16 years and older, just notice there's a different uh, formula if they're under 16 years, and we would like the GFR to be over 80 if they um under 16 years um, of age. So we expect kids to have very good kidneys before we start them on, on, on to nofibr. Our pregnant woman, you can't use the calculation, so you're going to use your absolute creatinine. And the absolute creatinine must be under 85 to be able to start this stuff. Positive crack. So now also important, if anybody's got a positive crack, they qualify for an LP. So that means the clinics, if they get a positive crack back from their results, they're supposed to send them to you, whether you're in the CHG or the district hospital, and you're supposed to do an LP on those patients. We don't just treat bile blindly. When you get your result back and the crack's positive, um, the serum crag is positive, but the LP is negative. So that's what we call a cryptococcogenemia. You're going to start your fluconazole on, on the same day as your ART. 1,200 milligrams for two weeks, 800 milligrams for eight weeks, and then 200 milligrams for at least one year until that CD4 is over 200. I'm not going to cover how we manage our positive crags. They'll be managed in internal medicine. Prophylaxis, so TB preventative therapy. Um, again, I'm going to go through this quite quickly, um, but we're going to be focusing. I want There's a whole little presentation and tutorials that I'll send you around on this as well. What's complicated about this is that there's a whole guideline that came out in 2023, um, which has quite dramatically changed what we've done. The guideline in its full entirety is not funded. So we're doing parts out of that guideline, and part of that is reflected in the latest ARV guidelines. So in all adults and adolescents that are um, more than 15 years, hold on, that's not completely, I just want to see, do I do the kids? Yes, I did do the kids, okay. So all adults and adolescents over 15 years, we're going to still do what we've always done. You start them on ARVs, and then you give them their INH for 12 months. We now have the option of something called 3-HP, which is a rifapentin and INH combination, and it's one tablet a week for 12 weeks. So that's very nice because there's literally a little strip of medicines that they take once a week for three months, does exactly the same as the INH for 12 months. We don't have that drug in the public sector at the moment, um, and you can only use it once people have already suppressed, so in that way it's actually not that helpful, um, but that might be something that will become more available in the future. Pregnant woman is confusing. There has been three different guidelines with three different recommendations. The one set of guidelines says we use it if the CD4 is under 350. The other, gu other guideline said we use it on all women. And the new advanced HIV guideline that's not yet released, it says we're not going to use it at all in pregnant women. So I am thoroughly confused on that. I would recommend follow the middle way. Certainly if the CD4 is under 350, TB is a major risk in our pregnant woman. And for this guideline, we actually did give input on that guideline to say that we think at least for CD4s under 350, our pregnant woman needs to be covered by INH um, and pyridoxin for the 12 months. So what's changed a lot is for the children. So now when you're initiating babies over the age of 14 weeks um, and they're HIV positive on the first diagnosis of HIV, all of them are now also getting routine INH cover. 
Um, they just have to be more than 20. If they're less than 25 kilograms, but they have to be more than 14 weeks old, we're going to give them INH for six months. It has to do with how babies, um, uh, the pharmacokinetics of these drugs. So you will not give the INH uh, for longer than, than six months. If they weigh more than 12, 25 kilograms, then you're going to use the INH for 12 months. So in practice, what this means is that any child... Any person over more than 14 weeks is HIV positive and more than 25 kilograms is going to get INH for a year. And then we have that lovely rifepentin INH possibly available in the future. And then, of course, don't forget your pyridoxin whenever you're giving INH. I'm not going to cover this um, slide. I'm just going to mention it, that the new guidelines was talking about covering all HIV negative contacts. We're not doing that yet because we don't have the money. But the idea would be is that if you've got a patient who's got TB, they would visit the household. Everybody in the household that's a high exposure contact will get that three months. So they'll get their little three months of RHP. And I think it can only work if we do the three RHP, which we don't have at the moment. Gotramoxazole, that's still the same. All people with CD4 less than 200, stage two, three or four disease. Um, we get, are getting back to them according to our guidelines. We're not sure where the stage two is. The evidence now shows us it's not makes much choice of giving, doesn't make much sense in giving back to them in stage twos. Um, the HIV Clinician Society has changed that to stage three and four, and that might just have been, that might change in the future. Once a CD4 is over 200, then you can stop your CTX. You only need one, you only need one um, value. So no longer do we have to get two values that's, that's over 200. So this is from the HIV Clinician Society, and the, this is not currently in our guideline. And you might decide in which scenarios do I want to do that. So this is scenarios where you are particularly concerned about TB iris. So say, for example, you've got somebody with one of those massive TB glands that looks, you know, because if they're iris, they start breaking down and getting all pussy. Or... So um, this is just to show you what's out there. There's a, there was a very nice trial done in Cape Town, which informed this guideline, and it's actually used quite a lot overseas. Um, so the idea is that newly diagnosed patients started on ART with a CD4 um, less than 100, sorry, not more than 100, less than 100, mistake on that slide. Um, you give prednisone 40 milligrams for 14 days and then 20 milligrams for 14 days. So it's like a one-month course of prednisone that you start with your TB treatment at the beginning. CD4 under 100. Um, and of course, they mustn't have resistant TB um, and you don't want to do that with patients with Kaposi's. More valid for us is paradoxical TB iris treatment. So say you've got somebody you've put on the TB treatment and now they're getting that, you know, the glands getting bigger and bigger or they're losing massive amounts of weight and they only weigh 35 kilograms or they've got a pleural effusion that keeps on filling up. Then you can use prednisone 1.5 milligrams per kilograms per day um, over a four week period. Um, and yet, quite often we use the same, the same dose, the same dosing as recommended there. How are you all doing? <laughs> this is very dry, was it just me? Um, but I'll try and highlight the stuff that you might not know and